Revised Common Lectionary, is taken from the Book of Psalms. These beautiful and poetic and even ancient words that come to us from thousands of years ago, many of them attributed to the great shepherd and king, David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. That I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, in the invisible, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, and I am still with you. We give thanks for the holy word of God. Let it speak to our minds and to our hearts. Today I offer a lesson I've entitled The Power of Presence. And because I've had the opportunity to visit with good friends from Kansas City and have many conversations, I've been reflecting upon the power of this presence and that we are each a work in progress. I know from my own growing up in the church that Sometimes we look to a minister thinking that he or she knows it all. (laughs) They figured it all out and they're going to tell you about it over and over again. (laughs) But no, I'm on this path with you. As many of you know who are here every Sunday, I've been going through about 10 months of my own health challenge, never having been seriously ill in my entire life of almost 60 years, and now facing not only the changes that one faces with a certain number of years behind them, (laughs) but the changes that illness can bring. But it has a blessing as well. Because it is when we meet trials, what the Bible calls tribulations, that big word, it's when we meet these in faith, assured that there is an answer, that there is a way, that then we discover a power and a courage and a strength to take the steps that we need to take as individuals to walk the path of our life. We're not in this alone. We surely, we have one another. And friends in a unity center are special because they've learned to see one another from a high perspective. We all know we face many challenges, each of different kinds. But we also know in our heart that each of our friends can call upon their creator 
can call upon the Spirit, can call upon Jesus Christ, can call upon that presence to be their strength, to walk with them. They face nothing alone. Well, I know going through my times of trial, there have been times when physical pain or a dwelling only upon the future, what might be but really isn't even here yet, putting our focus way out there, that sometimes that can weigh one's self down. I've known that. And we get lost in our pain and our troubles. Nobody knows. No, I won't sing it. (laughs) The troubles I've seen. But that's a song that each and every one of us can sing in our own way. We can't look out here at outer circumstances. I had a friend growing up in high school in Kansas City. I remembered for his 16th birthday when his parents gave him his new Mercedes to drive to school, a sports car. It wasn't long after that that he ran away from home. So unhappy, no one understood him. So it's a caution not to judge others' lives by, oh, the apparent things they have, the blessings they have. You don't know their heart. You don't know the fear that they may be inwardly experiencing and walking. And so we must remember to always hold one another, regardless of careers, social position, wealth. Everyone deserves a sustaining prayer. To begin today, I turn to an important teacher in my life experience, and that is the co-founder of Unity, Charles Fillmore. More than a hundred years ago, before Unity was even an idea yet born, his wife had had a tremendous healing experience. Charles was curious about what was going on. What was this presence and power? that his wife Myrtle had called forth, not only for her own healing, regaining her strength and in her 45th year bearing her third child. He wanted to know. And so naturally, like most of us do, we go to experts, don't we? Teachers, professionals. He began looking world round in every religious tradition that he was aware of in the late 19th century. Hinduism, Uh, various mystery teachings, on and on. But he finally came in all this babble, as he called it, to a point of confusion. There seemed to be conflicts between religious teachings, different ideas, so much going on. And finally he got to the essence. He said, if this God, this great spirit that all religions proclaim, if this is spirit, and I, as a creation of God, am spirit, then somehow, somehow we can communicate. Otherwise, the whole religion thing is a fraud. And so he began to take time to sit daily in the silence not with a laundry list of expectations, demands of God, but simply be still. To set aside his busy day, to sit still in the presence and the awareness that the creator of all is here, is present to him individually. And he wanted to listen. And in time, he began to have his unique experience of spirit, of God. Most importantly, he realized, as we can all realize, that he is not alone. That there is a power and presence with him. Now, I wanted to speak of this presence in a very particular way today. In unity, we teach that 
our spirit self, our higher self, our true self, is the perfect idea or master plan of us as created by God. And as we access that truth, it empowers us, it gives us thought and feeling that we can creatively use in our lives. In unity, we may mu- in unity, we make much of the words that we speak. We know that they're creative. They're speaking ideas into the world. And so we respect the power of the voice, the power of the word to carry ideas from the invisible inner experience of mind and heart and to carry them into the world where they can take form in relationships in creating things and objects, in gaining the necessities of life. This is our inner creative power. But what I wanted to bring to our attention today was just a little detail, and I have found it useful for myself in my recent weeks and months. I came up upon a book that I heard the author uh, explaining on public radio. Her name is Amy Cuddy. If you read her book, Presence, Presence is the title, if you read it, you'll learn much about her life and the challenges that she faced through a severe brain injury and coming back from that and earning her doctorate as a psychologist But what is more interesting to note to me was she did one of those TED Talks. Have you ever watched them on the Internet, the inspirational talks? Well, hers, by Amy Cuddy, if you want to look it up, is the second most uh, listened to talk that they have done. She gave it in 2012, and it is still the most highly rated and accessed talk. Well, we're actually not going to go into that. What she shares in her book and what I wanted to call to mind is something that she calls pose or gesture. And I would like to say in our unity tradition, we might want to call it body prayer or body affirmation. You see, Charles Fillmore said to those that came by greater and greater numbers to listen to him in Kansas City and through the Unity publications, he was hearing people say, well, I want greater prosperity in my life. I want greater health. I want more harmonious relationships in my family and with neighbors. And Mr. Fillmore would advise them in a very simple way. And he'd say, if you want these good things in your life, then do the things in life that cultivate these qualities. You've heard the cliche before. If you want to have a friend, be a friend. You take the creative action because you are a creative agent. As I spoke of months ago, we are each a creative agent. And so we can use these powers through our word, through our creativity, through music and poetry, to create that creative impulse. But Amy Cuddy was interested. Wait a minute. We have this wonderful thing in life, don't we, Larry, called a body. (laughs) This is a gift of God. And when you think about it, as the psalmist was musing, in the psalm that I read to you, our very existence. This body, in old unity, we called it the body temple. It is the house of our soul in this world. And sometimes we can treat it like a machine, or we can take take it for advantage until we suffer a health situation. And I discovered the wonderful gift of breathing that I was beginning to lose my grip through this pneumonia. So we must treasure our bodies, 
But Amy Cuddy in her book says we can do more than that. Our bodies can become a gesture or a pose that is an affirmation. I want to share with you this quote that she used that I found most fascinating. It comes from the famous individual, Frederick Douglass, a 19th century African-American civil rights activist of his day. And at a certain point in his life, he described that he walked a new walk, struck a fresh pose, and enjoyed it. He found it conducive to the idea of the person he thought himself to be. So she goes on. Look at your body. What you're saying, not only to the world, but to yourself. Through how you carry yourself in this world. Because this can be a positive tool. Now, William James, the father of psychology in the late 19th century, at a similar time that the film wars were developing unity, William James said something that turned his philosopher and scientist friends on their ear. They were shocked. He said, using a musical phrase, it's not because I sing Excuse me. I don't sing because I'm happy. I'm happy because I sing. That we have this creative power. I believe it was an old Dale Carnegie chorus that said, Act enthusiastic and you will be enthusiastic. Some contemporaries have rephrased that as, Fake it until you make it. But I don't actually like using the word fake. It sounds like we're being inauthentic, and that's not what it's really about. It's about taking a posture or pose that expresses the truth of who and what you are as created by God. Well, in her book, should you be interested in reading it, it is lengthy, but she goes through her many... um, research experiments as a social psychologist, all the research they did, but let's just cut to the bottom line. They found out that it was very effective for individuals to boost their confidence, their strength, their faith, their power, their joy in how they used their body. She described that You can try for yourself. Now, she said it's best not to do this in the middle of the classroom, a boardroom, in the middle of woods. One, people don't understand what you're doing. They question it. So in your private time at home or out of sight in a back room or whatever, before you begin to take up something important, whatever that may be, business meeting, school, meeting with the principal, with your child, whatever the case may be, strike a pose for yourself that reminds you of who and what you are as created by God. Or as Frederick Douglass put it, a use of the body that seems conducive to the high idea he had of himself, that you have of yourself. Now some of the most common ones that she cites that seem to be consistent worldwide in different cultures is the pose of the victor in cultures world round, not just the Olympics, but people have this sense of power when they are expressive with their body in a victory pose. She suggested another you may choose, certainly well known from our American television culture, and that is you can each strike the pose of Superman or Superwoman. The body takes up space. It's none of of this stuff. 
It takes up space. You remind yourself of your inner power. Many of you know that I studied a year abroad in Switzerland at the International School of Spiritual Science, and that founder, Rudolf Steiner, developed a very complex art of gesture, he called it. And I just wanted to point out that the gesture he assigned to the Christ, the truth of our being, was this. Notice the gesture. It can even be made horizontally. But the essence of the gesture, what it is telling you, is that you are stretching to the greatness, to the very limits of your being. I am not limited to simply my career or my citizenship here in Sunrise Beach. This gesture reminds me of the greatness, the breadth of my life. So I encourage you, consider not only the affirmations that we use during prayer time that tells you to go within to the reality that you acknowledge in mind and heart that you are in the presence of pure being, of life. You're not alone. This is good inner work. But we have the gift and the opportunity as human beings walking this earth to use these wonderful body that we have to teach ourselves and empower ourselves through something that seems so simple as a gesture or a pose. Use it. Try it. See what it is like before you have to do something significant. Maybe meet with your attorney or with a tax preparer or someone and you're feeling a little like this. Like when I've been ill and I have caught myself in a defeat pose, a fear pose. So often we hear of people curling up in the fetal pose in fear. Open, expand, take a place in the world that speaks of the truth of who and what you are as created by God. I have to take the opportunity to share this example. Geneva shared it with us at the concert Friday night. And furthermore, her story has been published by Unity. You see, she is now a 56, 56 year survivor of breast cancer. From 1960. And she brought this article that she wrote for Unity and shared it with me. And it brought an idea that as a minister, I should know. But you know, we don't know it until we grasp it in our mind and our heart. And she told her story of her challenge and her walk in faith with this phrase that made my ears perk up and it inspired me and I'm going to work with it. Because we can get lost in our worry and our fear. And Geneva reminded me, God has an answer. God has an answer for each one of us. For any challenge in this world, that we can face. There is an answer. And I know what it's like to be lost in fear. I've been here, I've been there lately, wondering what's going to become of me. What if I lose my health so entirely I can't work? I don't have anyone else that's taking care of me, unless they just show up. 
I have friends who help. But when you don't have family, you wonder, well, when the going gets really tough. But God has an answer. So in my affirmations, in my prayer time, and now in my poses, I'm going to, as Charles Fillmore said, strike a pose, hold a thought, do something that speaks to the presence and power that I claim is in my life. This God that brought me into being, there's an old truth statement. It says what God has created, God will sustain. And I invite you, especially the regular card-carrying members of this church, It's been a challenge this summer for our church financially. You know, the church is like us individually. It has to pay the utility companies. It has to pay the mortgage on this property. It has responsibilities because it is us. And we've had challenges. And so I say, let us hold... Geneva's motto for our church and its future and its well-being. God has an answer. Let us listen and let us be willing to do what we each can do to bring that answer, that solution, that possibility into expression. This is a good place. This is a good family. Unity is a good idea here at the lake. And it is worth our support. It is worth our consistent presence. We each have lies. My friends will return to Kansas City this afternoon. I know this. I can't keep them. (laughs) We all have things to do. We know this. Your board knows this. But it's also important that we do that college try that we each stand as superman and superwoman in this church and do what is ours to do. Everyone can lend a helping hand. Everyone can contribute what they are guided to do. And in that focus, in that working, in a unity purpose, the answer will be fulfilled. So let us take a moment and just affirm one last time for this hour our phrase, our affirmation. This is our inner prayer work. So turn your attention within. Contrary to what Some ministers, or perhaps I have even told you at times, meditation does not need to be a lengthy, complicated affair. Rudolf Steiner says five minutes can change your life and your world if you let go of your outer concerns, you turn within to the truth of your being, and declare, I am now in the presence of pure being, immersed in the Holy Spirit of life, love, wisdom. I acknowledge your presence and power, O blessed Spirit, in your divine and infinite wisdom. Now erase my mortal limitations, my mortal beliefs, and bring into manifestation my world through your pure substance of love, love for your creation. Bring my answer into expression according to your perfect law.
we give thanks that we do not walk this life alone. That in our inner work, we can make an affirmation, a statement that we have God-given power. That we are an expression of life itself. But then we conclude our prayer. And as we are ready, we open our eyes. And we once again enter the world of activity. We inwardly trust God's answer. Now, we do our creative part through word, through action, and even the gestures that express the truth of who we are as God's creation. I am a being of power, of presence, of joy, of strength, of compassion, of goodwill. I'm going to set that example to myself and to the world. I'll conclude with these words. Another extraordinary man from the late 19th century, I've mentioned several, but poor Nietzsche. He gets blamed with the statement, God is dead. He's made fun of. But what he actually said is, humanity, we have allowed God to be dead rather than keeping in our mind and awareness the presence and power of God, we have forgotten it. It's not God that is dead. It is our minds at times that don't remember. He also said something amusing. He said, these Christians, they're going to have to dance a better dance if I'm going to pay attention to them. In other words, if their truth, their faith, their religion, their hope in Christianity is so great and so good, I expect to see it expressed in how they move and how they are and how they relate in this world. So you see, you can go out into this world and be an example for the presence and the power that we speak of so much in words. Let us express it in our actions, our deeds, the way we are with one another, the way we are as a church in this greater community. So at this time, I invite our guests to come and express through music a gesture more eloquent, more beautiful than my words. I don't think so. In this very room There's quite enough love For one like me And in this very room There's quite enough joy For one like me And there's quite enough hope And quite enough power to chase away any gloom. The Spirit, 
His Spirit is in this very room, and in this very room, there's quite enough love. For all the world And in this very room There's quite enough joy For all the world And there's quite enough hope And there's quite enough power To chase away And the gloom Spirit, His Spirit is in this room, and in this room. There's quite enough love for all the world. And in this very room, there's quite enough love for all the world. And there's quite enough hope, and there's quite enough power to change. His Spirit, His Spirit is in this room.